right, I think we can get started now. So, welcome to our, our program on Teresa of Avila in the interior castle. My name is Tom Palanza. I work here at the parish. I do everything that the secretaries don't want to do and the priests don't want to do. <laughs> That's all me right there. Uh, so I do a lot of different things, but one of my favorite things to do is adult faith formation. Um, I have done some faith formation with grade school kids in the past. Has anyone else done religious ed for younger? Yeah, it's a chore. Right? Seventh grade's it, the best. Oh yeah, I did that too. Oh yeah, that's yeah. the best. Yeah. Uh, it's a totally different atmosphere when you get to work with people who have gone through their spiritual life a little bit more, realize the impact that their faith can have on their life, and now really want to be there. So I'm really grateful for all of you for being here, and I really, really look forward to working with you. So um, today, I just want to do kind of a brief overview of what we're going to do for the whole program, talk about what we're going to do today, and um, see where you guys are as far as your familiarity with Teresa of Avila and the interior castle. Before we get into that, I think that good, that good Catholic uh, faith formation starts with getting to know people, because Catholics are not really good at that. So we're going to play a game to begin. It's not really a game. You don't have to get out of your seats or anything like that. But if I could have you take your name tag out of the plastic, and then exchange it with the person across from you at the table. Or the person behind. <laughs> now on the back side of the name card you currently have, you're going to spend just two or three minutes talking with the person you exchange cards with. And you're going to learn one thing, one fun fact, about that person's spiritual life. And you're going to write it down, real simple, just real short, on the back of their card. Does that have to be fun? It does not have to be fun. <laughs> it can be serious. You're going to learn something about that other person's spiritual life. We are going to share those as a group. So if you don't feel comfortable sharing something too, too personal with everybody, then save it for later. Questions about what we're going to do? Okay, just two or three minutes we can, we can do it. Go ahead. <laughs> so this whole program, we're only meeting five times. July, 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 August, August. That's it. Today, I'm sorry. We didn't want to make it too much of a commitment. Um, today, we're going to just introduce the interior castle, Teresa of Avila, Carmelites, and then talk, watch a short video on the first chapter of her book, which covers the first mansion. Uh, and if you don't understand the mansion thing yet, that's okay. We'll get into that. Uh, today, again, just going to introduce Carmelites, Teresa, and what the world was like at the time she was alive. Talk about the interior castle, watch the video, and then we'll have some discussion time. Any questions before we dive in about the schedule or times or anything like that? For each week, there is kind of reading to do. If you, um, if you like, there's the interior castle. This looks much bigger than it actually is because this is a study edition, so it includes some of the commentary and indexes and that kind of thing. So the interior castle isn't very long, but it is difficult sometimes. Uh, so you might want to take your time reading it and read a little bit each day. There's a web page uh, dedicated to this program on our website. It's uh, falmouthcatholic.org. You go to the adult faith formation section, interior castle, and everything that you need is going to be up there from the text free online to YouTube videos of somebody reading the text out loud if you prefer listening to it. Um, we'll post these videos up on the website probably the following few days after we record them. Um, and then we have some resources on the website about 
good versions of the interior castle. There are a lot of translations. Some of them are very old. Some of them are very new and very good. Um, there are books about the interior castle if you want more help understanding what Teresa is talking about. So all of that is up on our webpage. So if you have any questions or you want to know more or resources about this, I encourage you to go to the website. Questions about that? Accessing it or anything? Okay. Okay, so about the Carmelites. First question, has anyone here ever heard of the Carmelites? Okay, most people. Is anyone here a lay Carmelite? Did you know there were such things as So the Carmelites are a religious order, just like the Dominicans, the Jesuits, the Franciscans. They're one of the larger religious orders in the world. They trace their roots back, well, kind of legendarily, to the prophet Elijah. They get their name from Mount Carmel in the Holy Land, which is right here. So this is Israel. This is Mount Carmel. Nazareth, where Jesus was born, not too far away. Jerusalem, quite a bit further. I'm sorry, Nazareth, where Jesus grew up. Jerusalem and Bethlehem, way down here. So it's a little ways away from Jerusalem. Mount Carmel itself is pretty close to the water. Um, and it's kind of a historic place for prophets to live. The most famous one being the prophet Elijah, who is definitely, besides Moses, the most famous prophet in the Old Testament. There are kind of two stories about the prophet Elijah that the Carmelites really like. One of them is really um, kind of offensive to a contemporary mindset, because one story is about Elijah proving that God is the only God, and all of the other frost, false prophets he puts to death. So, one of the Carmelite insignia is a raised hand holding a burning sword, which represents the zeal of the prophet Elijah for God, which nowadays we would not think too kindly of him killing, I think it was 400 prophets that they killed that day. We wouldn't think too kindly of that, but the prophet Elijah was trying to do something good. He was trying to turn the people of Israel back towards God, to choosing in their lives if they were going to serve the false god, represented by all these prophets, or if they were going to pick the real god, represented by Elijah. To do that, he says, you false prophets, you offer a sacrifice to your god, but don't light a fire. That's how you would offer sacrifice. You would burn your sacrifice, and the smoke would rise up to the god. He says, you do your thing, but don't light a fire. I'll do my thing and not light a fire. And whosoever god sends fire, that's the real god. So they do their thing, and they're trying to light a fire, and Elijah goes, why don't you, you know, try harder, you know, call to your God louder, maybe he's taking a nap. He really was kind of a, he liked to push buttons. So Elijah's like, maybe he's taking a nap, call louder, they call louder, nothing happens. Elijah, on his terms, still pushing buttons, goes, you know what, pour water on my sacrifice. So they pour water on his sacrifice, and he says, do it again, and do it a third time. So now everything is soaked. Elijah calls to God to reveal himself in this moment so that the people would believe in him and make this turn in their life. And sure enough, God sends down fire that laps up all the water, that takes away the sacrifice, and that even burns the stones that the sacrifice is on. So on that day, Elijah is credited with turning the hearts of the people back towards God. The Carmelites kind of have the same vein. Their whole point is to pray and to turn the heart towards God. They don't use the violent means that Elijah did, but the spirit is the same. Zeal for your house will consume me. That's uh, Psalm 69, which in the Gospel of John, when Jesus is chasing all of the animal vendors out of the temple area, he makes a whip and he chases them out. His disciples see him do this and they remember that psalm, zeal for your house will consume me. Jesus is just like Elijah, trying to turn the hearts of the people back towards right worship of God. 
So the Carmelites really love these stories. The second one being when Elijah hears that tiny whispering noise, and it's in that tiny whisper of a sound that he feels God's presence. It's not in this great thunder, it's not in wind, it's not in fire, it's in this little tiny noise. So the Carmelites also take that to heart. Their whole charism, their focus of their lives is prayer. Teresa specializes in that. She basically wrote the book on how to develop your prayer life, how to listen for that little tiny noise that bears the presence of God. Besides the legend of being traced back to Elijah, who was on Mount Carmel and did a lot of his work there, the hermits um, of the 1200s, there was a group of hermits who lived on Mount Carmel. They were Christian. They wanted to kind of live a very simple life and to really take to heart this, this move to listen for God's voice in quiet. They were there for a short amount of time, but this is the period of the Crusades. So the Christians came in, and they won the Holy Land, and then the Muslims would come in, they won the Holy Land, back and forth, back and forth. Mount Carmel is in the middle of all this, so they couldn't stay there for long. But this kind of forced them to go out and spread their Carmelite spirituality all across Europe. So by 1247, uh, basically 50 years after they, they decided to get started, they were all over Europe. They had a rule, which is a way of life for them, kind of detailing what they're going to do every day, what their mission is. And that was given to them by St. Albert the Great, who was the Bishop of Jerusalem at the time. Teresa of Avila comes in, she's born in 1515. So she's about 300 years after the beginning of the Carmelites. So her order is pretty well established, right? They've been around for a long time, and unfortunately things have gotten a little bit relaxed. After you've been around for 300 years, you kind of build up a lot of resources, you're able to take care of yourself. So life was pretty good for the Carmelites at the time of Teresa. Teresa didn't really see anything wrong with that at first. She entered the Carmelite order when she was about 20 years old. And for the next 20 years or so, she was pretty comfortable with the way that she was living. Carmelites, at her time, a lot of them would enter the convent as a way of getting out of societal uh, obligations that they had. So let's say you were a woman living in the 1500s, and your father was going to marry you off to a man who you really didn't like. The best way to get out of that was to become a sister. So a lot of women would do this at the time. They'd escape, maybe for not the best intentions, and join a convent. And if their families were wealthy, then they had a lot of resources to live very well at the convent. Their rooms could have more pillows, they could get better food, this kind of thing. Versus if you came to a convent with good intentions, but without any money, you were living a very severe lifestyle. So the disparity between the lives of people living in the very same building was very strong. And at first, Teresa didn't see too much wrong with this. Again, 20 years, she kind of lived this lifestyle of going along with the status quo. And then she finally has a big conversion when she's about 42 years old. 42 years old comes around. Teresa's been suffering from illness for a long time. An illness that's partially uh, will leave her paralyzed for a few days on end in different spells. She's suffering a great deal, and she finally realizes this is not the way to get closer to God. We are not doing what we are supposed to be doing. So she decides to reform the order. She doesn't want to create anything new. She just wants to get everybody back on the original path that the Carmelites wanted of living a very simple lifestyle. She employs the help of St. John of the Cross, who was quite a bit younger than her. Um, he helps her in a lot of different ways, especially working with the male Carmelites, who she really probably would not have had a whole lot of contact with. And he tries to reform their side of the order as well, to mixed results. He was actually imprisoned by the order for a certain amount of time, which just means he was locked away in his cell and he wasn't allowed to leave, so it was kind of like being imprisoned at home almost. But he was kept there for many years, wasn't allowed to leave until they kind of reviewed 
what he was thinking about, what he wanted to do, and then finally they let him back out so that he could continue his work. The reform that Teresa and John started eventually became called the Discalced Carmelite Reform. So today there are two main branches of Carmelites. There's the original branch, um, the authentic or the original observance. They're called O-Carm, that's their abbreviation. And then there's the Discalced Carmelite. They're the OCD, um, the Order of Carmelites Discalced. Discalced just means they didn't wear shoes. Again, at that time, things had gotten kind of comfortable for everybody, so leather shoes were the best thing to wear. Teresa and John and the Carmelites who followed them in the Reform decided that they were going to try and get even more simple. They adopted the footwear of the poor, which at the time was a sandal made out of rope. That was the cheapest thing that you could wear on your feet. So Teresa and John and their Reform became known as the shoeless Carmelites, the ones who wore sandals. To this day, I think that's still true, just like Franciscans, the discalced Carmelites will wear sandals on this all the time. Any questions about Teresa, the reform that she started, or...? Was she one of the rich people, or was she the poor? Teresa was pretty well off. Her father was a merchant, his father was a merchant, so they had established themselves pretty well in Avila, her hometown. Uh, so she would have been pretty well off, yes. Okay, so on the left I have a picture of what's today the Carmelite habit. So you can see the similarities for both the men and the women. They wear kind of like a Franciscan brown robe, but then they have this long piece of cloth in the front. Have any of you heard of the scapular, Our Lady of Mount Carmel? It's a small brown piece of, of uh, cloth. That small piece of cloth is kind of the everyday version of this, this long brown piece of cloth. The monks and the nuns in the Carmelite order, their scapular, which they all wear, is this big, front and back. So they wear this very long version of the scapular. The lay Carmelites similarly wear like a smaller bib size brown scapular. And then everyone else who's not actually a Carmelite but still wants to reap the benefits of the scapular, they wear that very small brown scapular. But this is the original, this very large version here. And then again, just a little picture of where Mount Carmel is in relation to the rest of the Holy Land. Any questions about that? I have been to the Holy Land yeah, and to Mount Carmel. It's very pretty. Although Mount Carmel, there's really not much there. There's a very small church, but there's a beautiful view over, over a valley there. Um, and then there's a larger convent kind of closer to the ocean, off the main mountain. But if you ever get to go, definitely Mount Carmel, just because of how pretty it is and everything else. Yeah? How many miles is that? I mean, it's amazing to think they walked that far. Yeah. So down here, oh, I didn't notice that. this is about 40 miles, my hand. Wow. So you probably got like, yeah, maybe about 80 miles or so from Mount Carmel to Jerusalem. Uh, so if you walk, I'm not going to do math because I don't do that, but if you walk two miles an hour, then it would take that many hours to walk to Jerusalem. The Holy Land is not very big. It's small. I think it's smaller than the state of New Jersey, something like that. And another thing, I remember as a kid wearing a scapula, what did I wear that for? So the, the uh, kind of devotion to the scapula uh, begins with a Carmelite named St. Simon Stock. He was English, I think. He was very early on in the Carmelite order, so he lived in the 1200s. He was one of the first Carmelites. The legend is that he had a vision of Mary and Jesus, the child Jesus, and she gave him the scapular and said, whoever lives, um, I 
forget if it was whoever lives well according to the Carmelite rule, wherein the scapular will surely go to heaven with my, with my help. Right? So the devotion nowadays with the small scapular is if you are living a good Christian life and you are you know, following the following the Christian life and kind of giving a special devotion to the Blessed Mother, then she will give you her protection and make sure that you get into heaven. I forgot all about wearing that as a child. Did yeah. You that? Yeah, a lot of people kind of abuse it a little bit and make it seem like they're wearing a magical pendant or something like that. And that's not how it works. Like, if you wear that and you kill somebody and then you die, Mary's not going to help you get into heaven. <laughs> right? So you, you actually have to live a good life. Uh, but the scapular is kind of Mary's way of visibly giving her protection to those who, who wear it. So, yeah, of course Mary gives her protection to whoever wants it. You don't need the scapular. But it's like a visible sign of that, that promise. Now, I've seen a green one. Oh, I'm colorblind, so I wouldn't even know. <laughs> no, but I mean, is, is that from a different yeah, order sure. or something? I, I'm sorry, what was you it is, it is a different tradition. Yeah, okay. I can't remember it. I think it might go back to St. Vincent's Paul, but I'm not sure. Oh, okay. Yeah, there are different versions of the scapular. Oh, okay. I think Our Lady of Mount Carmel is the most popular, but there are others, yeah. Other questions? The Carmelites or Holy Land? Okay. So, what's going on in St. Teresa's life? She lived in a busy time, right? Everybody thinks that today is the worst time. Nowadays are the worst days. Nowadays, nothing is going right. Well, that's not a good view of history because Teresa lived in probably a way worse time than what we live in right now. So, in Teresa's life, the Protestant Reformation was happening. The Council of Trent happened. And then because she lived in Spain, the Spanish Inquisition was happening. And there was also a lot of war with the Muslims who had come into Spain through Africa. So she's going through all of this right now. Again, Teresa is born in 1515. Catherine of Siena is, uh, starts her work in 1374, so about 200 years before Teresa. And Catherine starts her work because she can already see how many bad things are going on in the church. Remember, in Catherine's time, she lived through having at least two popes at one point when the pope was over in France. So there were multiple popes. Can you imagine that nowadays? Like, we never think of having, besides for Pope Benedict who retired, she had two popes who were fighting with each other, saying that both of them were the real pope. So that's already pretty crazy. Catherine starts doing her reform, calling people to get in line and start, you know, doing things right. 200 years before Teresa, before Martin Luther, she already could see that problems were happening. Martin Luther, he does his famous 95 Theses on the church door, which he probably didn't post to the church door. He probably very respectfully handed it to the bishop, but that's besides the point. That's 1517. A lot of people say that's the big start of the Protestant Reformation. So Teresa is born just before the beginning of the Protestant Reformation. The Reformation goes on until about 1515. So that famous story of Henry VIII, who separates from Rome so he can divorce his wife, that happens when Teresa is about 20 years old or so. And then the Reformation kind of wraps up more or less in 1555. So that was a crazy time for Teresa uh, to be in. The Council of Trent was the response to the Reformation. All the Protestants were saying, look, the Catholic Church has all these problems, what are you going to do about it? Well, the Catholic Church finally got around to things in 1545, so kind of in the middle, kind of towards the end of the Reformation. They said, okay, yeah, you're right, we do need to get things in order. So they spent about eight years discussing how they're going to get back on the right track. Uh, again, the council was called both to kind of respond to the criticisms of the Protestants, but then also just to reform the church in general. Because Catherine was right, things were not going so well, and the church needed a little bit of reform. And then the Pope who closed the council was Pius IV, who is most famous because he closed the Council of Trent, not much else. 
the Spanish Inquisition, of course, we've probably all heard about the Spanish Inquisition and the abuses of power that happened there. Those are true, but often overblown a little bit. Um, definitely the discrimination against people who were Jewish, who were Muslim, and people who used to be Jewish Muslim and converted to Christianity, there was a lot of discrimination and persecution of those people in Spain. So Teresa had to live through all of that too. Um, and the war with, um, with the Muslims. The last Muslim king of, who uh, ruled in Spain was 1492, so before Teresa was born, but not, that, not too far away. And then after him, there were still various uprisings from the community because they felt persecuted, discriminated against. So there were still battles going on with the Muslims in the southern part of Spain at the time. So Teresa's time, this is kind of the background of her, um, was a very turbulent time. And her way of dealing with all of that is to go to a convent and dedicate her life to prayer. So I think that's kind of a interesting thing to think about is how useful is prayer? Well, during all of this, Teresa decides prayer is the best thing she can do. So I think that's a good question for us too as you read the interior castle and think about your own spiritual life. How good is my prayer? Is it doing any good in the turbulent times that I live in? Teresa thought it did a lot of good in her time. Okay, so this is Europe at the time of Teresa. It's a little bit different. Of course, we have Spain and Portugal, France, and then the Holy Roman Empire, which is Germany and Austria and a lot of other things now. Um, the Holy Roman Empire was basically a lot of little states that tried to do their own thing and were constantly fighting with each other, but more or less fell under the jurisdiction of the Holy Roman Emperor. Um, and then, of course, you have the Ottoman Empire, and everything here in Africa is all Muslim, and then the rest of Europe up here is Catholic. The biggest Protestant areas are um, this area of Germany, and then eventually England, and then some of the stuff over here. Questions about that? Do you know what Lithuania was? Were they like kind of part of the Holy Roman Empire anyway, or were they just misread what they? Yeah, at this time, um, they probably were a mix of Catholic, Orthodox, and Protestant. Because Russia would have remained quite Orthodox, um, along with most of this section over here, would have remained kind of Orthodox, going back to an even earlier schism in the church, around the 1000s, I think the, um, the Eastern Orthodox Church and the Western Latin Church split. So that would have been about 500 years before Teresa. So that part of Russia and everything, that would have been kind of orthodox. And Lithuania, I'm not sure exactly, but them falling on that line, probably a mix of Catholic, Protestant, and Orthodox. Other questions? So that's basically what Teresa knew when she was alive. Okay, so we covered some of this. Teresa, born 1515, died 1582 in Avila, and I have a map to show you where that is next. Um, when she's 11 to 14 years old, her mother passes away, that was a big impact on her life. And then when she's 28, her father passes away. She'd already been in the convent, and people didn't live for quite as long at that time either, so that wasn't quite as big of a shock. But still, he was a big figure in her life as well. She enters the Carmelite convent when she's 20, but it's 22 years before she has her conversion. So I'd like to put that number up there because if we ever get frustrated with ourselves, you know, why am I not living better than I want to be? And it's taking so long for me to progress in my spiritual life. Well, it took the master, Teresa is known as the doctor of prayer, it took the master 22 years just to get around to realizing she wasn't living a good life. And then the rest of her life to actually reach the type of prayer that we're going to be talking about in the interior castle. So if you don't think that you're progressing fast enough, I would say don't worry. You're probably doing just fine. It took Teresa a long time to get 
to where she was. So she writes The Interior Castle. It's the last book that she writes. She's 62 years old, so about five years before she dies. She had already been kind of experiencing the deepest level of prayer that she describes in The Interior Castle. So everything she, she writes is what she herself has experienced, which, as you read The Interior Castle, it's kind of mind-blowing to think that anybody could experience what she did, but that was, uh, that's where she was in her spiritual life towards the end of her life. She was canonized in 1622, which is notable because most of the time it takes hundreds of years for you to actually get named a saint at that time. So the fact that she was only was 40-something years after she died is rather remarkable. Her saintliness was very well known by a huge portion of Europe very soon after her death. And again, that's no email, no phone, roads are bad, letters to people, the printing press is brand new, very few people are using that. So sh the fact that word about her saintliness got out so quickly is very remarkable and shows kind of the quality of her writing and her person. And then she was named a Doctor of the Church in 1970, at the same time as Catherine of Siena. Um, and they were the first two women to be given that title. So it took a very long time for the church to actually name somebody, name a woman the, a Doctor of the Church. Teresa was one of the first people that they thought of. Are you familiar with that term, Doctor of the Church? Kind of. So a Doctor of the Church is somebody who's writing about the faith um, has been deemed to be beneficial for your spiritual life. Their writings are not the same level of scripture because that's inspired by the Holy Spirit, the Word of God. Their writings are not like that. Their writings are not always right. However, if you read their writings with a discerning eye and under the guidance of current church teaching, then you are sure to benefit from reading their writings. So they're authoritative, but not the same way that scripture is, and not even the same way that the pope or the bishops are. So take, for example, St. Thomas Aquinas is the most famous doctor of the church. Um, he wrote about the Blessed Mother and the Immaculate Conception. He actually said that Mary was not totally free from sin when she was conceived, which is not the teaching that the church decided to go with. So even the most famous doctor of the church has been wrong sometimes. So take some comfort in that. We also get to be wrong sometimes because even the best people are wrong. So that's what doctor of the church means. It means that their writings are very beneficial for your spiritual life. They won't lead you astray unless you misunderstand what they're talking about. But you still have to read them with a discerning eye. Questions about any of this? Cool. Okay, so here's Avila. So on this map of Spain, can everyone see that little pin that's dropped up there? That is Avila, right here, not too far from the center. Madrid is right at the center. Avila is not too far from there. Um, and Teresa did quite a bit of traveling, mostly in this area of Spain. Um, she would eventually establish 14, I think 14 different continents. In that area. I bring up these two pictures because these are some of the most famous medieval walls in all of Europe. The entire town of Avila is surrounded by these walls, which most towns at the time were, but not all of those walls actually survived. So the ones at Avila actually did survive, and now I just read that they are the largest fully illuminated monument in the entire world. So they spent a lot of money to put lights all around the walls and light all of them up at night. I don't have a picture of that. But because we're reading the interior castle, and because this is where Teresa grew up, and we might wonder, why did Teresa use the image of a castle? Well, she grew up in kind of what looks like a big castle, right? So this is the wall here in Avila, going all the way around with these turret looking structures. And then this is a little difficult to see, but this is how wide the turret is. This is large enough for a person to walk through, so that kind of gives you an idea of the size of the wall at the time. And this goes all the way around the city. Questions about that?
is very pretty. There's even mountains in the background and everything. I didn't have a picture of that, but well worth going to. Well, why did they, who were they protecting themselves from when they built this one? Yeah, so again, at the time, Europe was much less unified than what we think of now. So even a place like Spain um, had a lot of power struggles. One, we talked about the, um, the Moors, the Muslims who lived in the south of Spain. At the time when there were Muslim kings in Spain, they would have been a threat. They would have you know, come up and tried to lay siege to the town. Different factions of powerful families in Spain would vie for power with each other. You never knew when France was going to come down or something like that. So you kind of had to build these walls to protect yourself from <clears throat> even the city next to you. If they ran out of food or something, they might want to come over and take your food from you. So the, the kind of state of things at the time was a lot less secure than what we're used to now. Did, um, did all towns have the castles around? Like any that? town that walls could afford it would do it. Oh. So not all of them have it because sometimes couldn't afford it. Um, Avila was pretty well off, so they they did do it. Okay, so the interior castle. What is the interior castle? Again, it's the last book that Teresa wrote. The interior castle is Teresa telling you what she believes is the best description of the human soul and its journey towards union with God. That's the whole interior castle. So when you read the interior castle, you're reading Teresa's description of your soul and her soul. As she went through her spiritual life and she grew closer and closer to God, she was able to translate that experience into language for us, which is a big deal. If you think of who God is, the creator of everything, the mystery beyond all mysteries. There's no way to say something about God because He's just so far above you. The only reason you can speak about God is because He tells you stuff about Himself, which is what the Scripture is. It's God telling us about Himself. So when Moses gets his call from God to lead Israel out of Egypt, God says, Moses, I want you to do this. And Moses goes, okay, I'll do it, but the people will probably want to know who you are. So what's your name? And God says, I am who I am. Which, if your kid told you my name is I am who I am, probably. <laughs> I mean, what kind of answer is that? Moses is like, that's not a name. I don't know anything about you because of that. <clears throat> But Thomas Aquinas and a lot of other theologians say, no, no, that actually tells you the most you can know about God. God says, I am who am. I am the one who exists. I am reality. I am the one who had no beginning, who has no end. There is no me that cannot be. I am. I exist. And everyone else, you, the Israelites, the world, everything else, the stars, is only around because I want it to be around. My name is above you. You can't know me. All you can know is I am who I am. Everything else you have to trust. So, the scripture is God telling us about himself. There is no talking about God because he's so far above us, right? Beyond our understanding. It'd be like one dog asking another dog, tell me about your human owner. The dog would be like, oh, they're nice. <laughs> but they, got, they can't tell, like, the dogs can't talk about you because you are so far above them. They don't understand what you're capable of, right? The same thing with us and God. We can't understand what God is capable of. We can't talk about God. That's the beautiful thing about Jesus is that God, who we can't talk about, comes down and becomes one of us. This is a central 
point for Teresa. Your journey to God has to go through Jesus. Because Jesus is God and human at the same time. It's like if you could become a dog, then you could talk to your dog about you. Right? Because now you're at the same level as them. You're able to use their language, use their images. That's what God does with Jesus. Jesus is God who comes down and tells us about God. And in St. John's Gospel, what is the first term that St. John calls Jesus? The Word. Jesus is the one who speaks about God, which the word theology just means speaking about God. So Jesus is the theologian. Right? For Teresa, if you want to know God, you have to go to Jesus. There's no other way. So at the center of your castle, the center of your spiritual life, the goal of your spiritual life has to be aimed at Jesus. Otherwise, you're never going to get to full union with God. Because God extends His hand down to you as Jesus, and it's Jesus who reaches out to lift you up to God. That's how God accomplishes that union that He so desires to have with you, through Jesus. So for Teresa, the interior castle is your journey towards that union with God. And all of that takes place inside your soul. Especially as Christians who are baptized and sealed in confirmation with the Holy Spirit. We believe that the Spirit dwells within us. So to go inside your own soul is to go to meet God, to meet the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit who keeps the presence of Jesus alive in our lives. The Holy Spirit who the priest calls upon at the Mass to bless and sanctify these offerings of bread and wine to make them the body and blood of Jesus for us to eat and internalize. So for Teresa, this whole Catholic life from Mass baptism, confirmation, participation in the Eucharist, all of that leads to union with God. Your prayer life and your sacramental life go hand in hand, step by step, leading you towards union with God. Through the sacraments and through your prayer life, that's how you accomplish that. So they're just some fun with words. I love words and etymology of words. So if you enjoy this, uh, the word mystery in English comes from the Greek word mysterion, which is used to describe secret rites or teachings. So a lot of religious groups, their teachings, their doctrine in Greek, you call that mysterion, mysteries. That word comes from the word Mystes, which means an initiate, somebody who knows about those secret rites and teachings. But then that Greek word mystes comes from mayin, which means to close or to shut. All of those up there because I like the end. That idea of mystery being connected to the idea of being closed or being shut. And for Teresa, that union with God relies very heavily on your ability to go inside to kind of close out the distractions of the world in order to reach the truth. So for Teresa, your spiritual journey is about getting rid of distractions, including your own personality traits that distract you, getting rid of distractions in order to reach that union with God. Actually, um, this Greek word mystery is the word that we that we have changed into our word for sacrament. So in the Greek church, they still call their sacraments the mysteries, where we use the Latin word sacrament to talk about the sacraments. So whenever you participate in baptism, confirmation, the Eucharist, you're participating in a mystery, something that's kind of above you, that's calling you towards union with God. So then this point about the inspiration, actually, let me pause there, because that was a lot. Um, do you have any questions about, yeah? Well, just something that you said that um, I think needs to be balanced. You talk 
talked about um, the sacraments and contemplation of prayer. realities that have to be in the flesh in the way we live and in the way we reach out to the poor and the way we flesh the values of Jesus in our everyday life and can't just be left at a sacramental or you know, mystical level of the, the, the proof of, the, of the, the depth of our prayer is in the correlation of our actions. Certainly. That, that's really, really important. Yes. So, take the example of Jesus himself, who not only um, is found in the Gospels as praying quite frequently, especially at very important moments in his life. He prays before he's about to do something. He prays after he has done something. Um, Jesus is praying and then ministering to people. And then he's also getting baptized. And he's also instituting the Eucharist. And he's also calling Peter the rock. So Jesus himself has that mix of the sacramental life, prayer life, and ministerial life where he's in service to others. I think Teresa would wholeheartedly agree with you that if you are engaging in the sacraments and you think you're praying well, but you're not behaving well, then those other two things are not real. You're not doing those with a genuine, with an authenticity. You're doing something else wrong there. And I think the fruit of her whole prayer was her reformation of her congregation. I mean, it led to discerning, you know, what needed to be changed and then actually having the courage to do it. To do it, physically yeah. Physically to do it. Yeah. There's a very famous legend, at least. I don't know if it, I can't remember if it actually happened, but there's a legendary story about Teresa where she's crossing a river she's crossing a river and she asks she prays and asks God for help to cross the river because that was there was no bridge it was kind of a dangerous thing to go across in a cart she's going across going across and then she falls off the cart into the water like kind of near the shore but still soaking wet and muddy and gross and she says to God you know I ask you for your help but if this is the way you treat your friends no wonder you have enemies <laughs> you know she just got so upset <laughs> but that was, you're right, she had that, that call to do something, to action, um, that she couldn't resist, even when it was so difficult for her. Uh, and look at the humanity of her relationship with God. See, that's what I love. Yeah. yeah. You know, that she can say that kind of thing like that to God. Right. <laughs> so I have her definition of prayer in a couple of slides, and I think the humanity of what she sees as her relationship with God comes out there. So there are, uh, are there any other questions about um, prayer and the sacramental life going together, or the image of the human soul and its relationship with God, which Teresa is going to talk about at length in the book, so we don't have to answer all your questions now on that. Okay, so for the interior castle, she uses this image of a castle for your soul. There's kind of three ways of looking at that. Why did she use that image? For Teresa, she uses that image because it's from her own experience. This is how Teresa has experienced her visual life, as moving through these stages. For her, there are seven stages. So she's kind of experienced this in her life, and this is the tool, this castle image, the tool that she's using to explain that experience for us. The castle has some symbolic um, nature to it as well. Teresa is describing stuff that's of God, her relationship with God. So it's kind of outside of her ability to describe perfectly. So she has to use analogies. She has to say, your soul is like a castle. Your spiritual journey is like passing through seven mansions. So if you're reading and you think to yourself, uh, this lines up with my experience, but this is not really what I experienced in my prayer life. Well, two things. One, that's a good time for you to check yourself to see, okay, have I been approaching this wrong? Can Teresa help me here? But two, also, Teresa's using a symbol. It does not have to be 
exactly what you experience. So if your experience doesn't line up perfectly with Teresa's, that's okay. Her image can only go so far. And then it doesn't cover every single um, facet of what you might experience. And then finally, there's a theological way of looking at the castle. Again, this is Teresa trying to explain what she knows or has come to learn about God. So the castle and all the imagery that she uses is her way to try to tell us about what she has experienced, which is high and beyond expression. She's been given the gift to tell us about it with words. So a lot of people who have these experiences of God, they just can't talk about it because they don't know how. They literally don't have the words to describe what they've experienced. Teresa, when she would say because of the help of the Holy Spirit, was able to actually put words to what she experienced for the benefit mainly of her sisters and then for whoever else would be able to read her work after. So this theological part answers, tries to answer questions like, what is the soul? Who is God? What is my relationship with God? How does my relationship with God develop? What are the difficulties of development? How can I know what is true and real? That's a big topic for Teresa, is discerning reality and figuring out what's real and what's not. Okay, I have these up here only to scare you. <laughs> you do not have to learn anything here. So these are just two visual representations of the interior castle. The one on the left is very good. The one on the right is very bad, because I did the one on the right, and a very talented Carmelite nun did the one on the left. Um, so this is the visual representation of the interior castle. There are a lot of ways of trying to visualize it. These are just two. Um, you can see how complicated it can be. Right? This is basically the whole book in one picture. This one in particular. It's really well done, and I'll hand this out um, at a later time. But you have down here, uh, up top here, these are these little gateways, are ways that evil temptations can enter your soul. So Teresa has mapped out all the different things that might try to tempt your soul away from God. Versus down here, you have all the virtues and good things that are going to help you to get towards God in the center. You can see here some of these lines are solid, those are walls. You can only get to the next level, the next ring, by going through this particular gate. And then once you get to this point in your spiritual life, God is kind of this dotted line. God's grace is reaching out into your soul. And when you hit this level, you don't have to worry about temptations anymore. The devil can only get so far with temptation, which I think is a great comfort. Like a lot of people can get kind of stressed out about the influence of the devil. Teresa says, yeah, in your soul, you can get a lot of temptation. You can see how big these rings are. Look at all the, she describes them as like snakes and reptiles, alligators and toads. All these bad things can get into your soul, but then you notice these squiggly lines, these bad things, they're not in here. They can't reach this fire, which I think is a great comfort. The fact that you are made in the image and likeness of God, baptized, sealed with the Holy Spirit, receiving the Eucharist. God lives within you and is exerting His power within your very soul. So there's only so far that these temptations can go. And then as you get closer and closer, you draw closer and closer to God, which is represented by this triangle, the Holy Trinity. You get closer and closer to here, and deeper and deeper, she would say, inside of the castle. And uh, she uses the imagery of being married when you get to this level of union. You're now in a spiritual marriage with God, which I think is really, well, beautiful on many levels, but if you think of this diagram, so this is what your soul is supposed to look like, right? The castle is the image of the human soul and its progress towards God, who lives in the deepest part of your soul. Well, if this is supposed to be your soul, you'll know that for Teresa, you are not at the center of it. 
God is at the center of your soul. So if you own a home, who sleeps in the master bedroom? You do, the owner of the home. But in your soul, the person who occupies the centermost room, the most important room, the master room, is God. So in your spiritual life, who does your soul belong to? For Teresa, it doesn't belong to you. It belongs to God. So your spiritual journey is about getting to hear this spiritual marriage where you hand over everything that you have and entrusted to God and God hands over everything He has and entrusts it to you. Just like you would with a, a spouse, Adam and Eve. The two became one flesh. So to here, you become one with God. So your spiritual journey is about letting go of this idea that you control your you own your own soul, you are the master of everything, and realizing that it's God who's the master of everything. And if you can let go of everything and make your way to the center, miraculously, you receive everything back and more. Because again, you hand over everything to God, you let go of everything, and God gives everything back to you. Just like Christ on the cross, He gives up everything, His life, hands over His life, and what does He get back? His life again, only eternal, undying. This is the image of growing closer to God. Yeah? It's really interesting because it makes me think of how one of the traits that Jesus really espoused the most, goes along with us so nicely, is humility. Because you have to let go of yourself to reach that center. And then also with other great philosophers like Plato, you know, he understood how important it was that ego was, you know, to get too self-centered and, you know, humility. You versus dangerous, basically. Yeah. And it kind of goes along with that thing, which I think is interesting. Yeah, for Teresa, um, in one of her other books, uh, The Way of Perfection, which is kind of the starter book for her nuns, there are basically three books about prayer that Teresa writes. The Way of Perfection is the beginning. The Book of Her Life is the next step up. And then The Interior Castle is the last step. So we're kind of doing things backwards by starting at the top. Um, but in The Way of Perfection, if you do a word count, again, I love words. If you do a word count, the two words that show up the most are humility and detachment. More than the words faith and more than the word hope. Humility and detachment are the virtues for Teresa. And the only thing that comes close to that is the word love, which I think is just about the same amount. So to, for Teresa, if you want to reach love, which is the word that she talks about the most, you need humility and detachment. She doesn't even bother with faith or hope, she says the real work is humility and detachment. And humility for her is not being, not putting yourself down, it is knowing yourself. It is knowing who you are. Not thinking less of yourself and not thinking more of yourself, but having that true image of who you are, that's what humility is. That's real humility. Again, so I just put these up here to impress you with what Teresa can do. There's no need to learn any of this. And then my example over there is that there are many ways of imagining the interior castle. I did it uh, in the shape of a cross, which some other people have done. Um, so you can kind of put your own, as you're reading, you can put your own visual to what the castle looks like. For me, Teresa begins by quoting St. Paul and talking about the height and depth, the length and the breadth of the soul, right? which for me automatically makes the shape of a cross. So I tried imagining things in the shape of a cross, and since your journey is a journey towards Jesus, it makes sense that at the center, uh, where Jesus is, you'd also find the cross. And I think you'll find that cross imagery show up, which we said quite a bit too. You could 
going to give us the copy of that? I will, yeah. Yep. This, and I think I have, I have one more too, so I'll give you a copy of all of them. Are you going to explain your cloth illustration? Oh. I'm fascinated. Uh, sure, I can try. <laughs> so it's not very big, but. So Teresa talks about um, your, so you begin here. Actually, you can technically begin here with the Trinity because everything begins with God. So our move towards God doesn't begin with our deciding to move towards God. It begins with God inspiring us, which comes from um, the same word that uh, the word breath comes from, a symbol of the Holy Spirit. So the movement starts with the Holy Spirit coming down towards us, coming out to us, and moving us, giving us that little push to start journeying towards God. So you have this first section here. I just grouped uh, mansions one, two, and three together because those deal with overcoming earthly barriers. So the part that's kind of down, connected to the earth. The first move is a move kind of through the world to get through that stuff on your journey to God. And the Holy Spirit and prayer is constantly helping you through that. So then you get there and you move up to this first part, which is the divine pull, she says. So at first, you're kind of making an earthly move towards Christ. So your whole imagery is towards Jesus, and he's trying to walk you through all the difficulties you experience on earth. So you start with this lower part, and then you move up towards the heavenly part. In mansions four and five, you have this freedom from all of your earthly problems, your earthly attachments. You feel kind of like a, a first glimpse of the mystical union with God. So you have this move kind of upwards towards God in the fourth and fifth mansions. Then you come down here, mansion six, you have union with the work of Christ and living for others. So kind of what you were saying, Jimmy, uh, you know, you have your earthly concerns, you have this move towards God, but that move forces you again towards other people too. So as you progress through the castle, you're not just improving yourself, you also have this move outwards towards helping other people as well. So you can kind of see this imagery of being spread out now on the cross. It's not just you, it's also others too that you have to be concerned with. So you have this move towards other people and helping others. And then on the other side, in Mansion 7, you have this union with the will of Christ and death of self. So now your, your centeredness is here. This is kind of the you line, getting past earthly things, moving towards God. But then you're forced to move out to other people. And then on the other side of moving out to others is the move towards Jesus again. So now you're emptying yourself, you're getting rid of this center line, and you're moving to union with Jesus. Uh, and that kind of brings you here towards union with the whole Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So that's kind of the imagery that's going on there. It's not quite as... Uh, it's not quite as linear as this is, where you're going from outside in. There's kind of more movement here. But sometimes that's the way that the Holy Spirit moves us is all over the place. It doesn't look like we're going in a straight line towards our goal. In fact, the line's not straight, but it's constantly moving forward, kind of like a spiral goes around and around, but it's still moving in a direction. That's fabulous. Thanks. Yes? The other thing, too, I think, you know, when I look at the two diagrams, I think that it could be a real effort on my part, for example, to really work very, very hard, moving from one mansion to another mansion to another mansion. And it really, you know, I, I think the spiritual journey really depends on listening and moving to the seduction of the spirit. I'm glad you brought that up. Right. And it's not going to be because of my efforts. Yeah. 
So, okay, yeah. So, uh, you were mentioning, you know, who's doing the work? Well, Teresa, um, Teresa has three different kinds of prayer. There are a lot of ways of dividing types of prayer. Teresa looks at it from this point of view. She says there's aesthetical prayer, where you're doing the work, right? This is the first three mansions. When you're at the f level of the first three stages of your spiritual life, you have to put in work. Teresa doesn't like sisters who sit around and complain that they're not getting any closer to God, because God's not bringing them there. Teresa would say, you're not doing your part. So in the first three levels, you've got to do work. Ascetical prayer. The next stage, levels four to seven, that's mystical prayer. So as you get deeper in your spiritual life, you move from a type of prayer where you have to put in work. You have to pay attention to the words. You have to close out distractions. You've got to listen to what Father's saying in the homily. You know, you should, but it's not your problem. You've got to put in the work. Mystical prayer, you don't do the work. It's God who does the work. So levels four to seven, if you get in those, that's a gift. That's God giving you that. They're a complete gift, not acquired through your effort. So you can get through level three, and say, okay, I've been doing my part, God. But then when you get through level four to seven, it's not in your hands anymore. So you can't blame somebody for not getting all the way to the center, because a lot of that depends on God and His time. Because this is an intimate relationship, personal relationship that you have with God and no one else. So God is going to work with you as you need it, not how anyone else needs it. There are some general rules, like Teresa thinks you can get to level three on your own. So if you don't do that, well then, the fault is yours. Everything else is up to God. And then she says that there's also painful prayer, which I think is fascinating. She says there's ascetical prayer, that you have to do the work. There's mystical prayer, where God is doing all the work. He's giving you this. The third one, she says, painful prayer is an actual type of prayer. Painful prayer, you've probably heard of the dark night of the soul. Um, it's an experience where it doesn't matter how much work you do, it doesn't matter how much preparedness you get ready for this experience of God, you don't experience anything. There's no presence of God. There's no consolation, there's no good feeling, there's no feeling of having met God. You don't even remember what it was like, even if you had a union with God before, you can get to this painful prayer because you no longer even remember what it was like. That's how dark this, this state of your soul is. It's not that you've done anything wrong, it's simply you don't experience the presence of God and yet you continue praying. And your prayer hurts because you formed this intimate relationship with God and He's not there. And there's nothing more painful than building an intimate relationship with somebody and then them not being there. So Teresa says, you continue praying, but it hurts. And the only way to get through it is by waiting. You wait for God's mercy. That's it. Uh, most com most uh, recent example of this, a lot of people say Mother Teresa uh, talks about experiencing a spiritual dryness for a long time. Maybe right up to the end of her life, I, I can't remember. She experienced this painful prayer, where her prayer was actually a labor. It was hurtful. 
It was having formed this intimate relationship with God and then experiencing Him abandoning her. Kind of like Jesus experiences on the cross. This, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Which is Psalm 22, which ends with waiting for God's mercy and hoping in the mercy of God. So what Teresa is describing and what popular saints nowadays, Mother Teresa, have experienced is what Jesus experienced. So you can see all this stuff actually, I mean, it has connections to reality. It's not just Teresa, it's not just Teresa making stuff up. She's describing probably too what Jesus went through, who also was human and divine even though his spiritual life totally different than ours. So she also says there's this type of painful prayer. And you can understand how that would be painful based on this, this bullet here on prayer. She de defines prayer as a loving, personal relationship with the Lord. She says, speak with God as with a father or a brother, or Lord or as with a spouse, sometimes in one way and other times in another. For mental prayer, in my opinion, is nothing else than an intimate sharing between friends. It means taking time frequently to be alone with him who we know loves us. So this is what prayer is for her. So people ask you, what is prayer? You say, it is spending time with God, as if he's a friend who I want to spend time with, because he loves me. Uh, so I talked about this a little bit already, this idea of us making that relationship with God all begins with Jesus becoming human. So the fact that Jesus brings divinity down to us, to our humanity, allows our humanity to rise up to His divinity. So the only reason you can have this relationship with God is because of Jesus who was God and human. This word kenosis is, again, I love words, a fancy Greek word that means empty. So again, we talked about emptying yourself, closing things out, getting rid of distractions, letting everything go in order to meet God, and getting everything back from God. This is what Jesus does. Again, God is this thing that's so far above us. How is it possible for Him to become human? Wouldn't He, like, explode humanity? How can this shell contain God? How could Jesus become human? Jesus lets go of everything in order to become human and take on our humanity. He remains God. He lets go of all the beautifulness of living with God in the Trinity, in heaven. Let's go of all that joy in order to become human. Let's go of everything on the cross. Even let's go of the humanity that he's been given in order to show his love for God, in order to gain everything back again. So this kenosis, this emptying, is the same thing that we're called to. Letting go of everything that we have in order to receive everything that God wants to give us. So I'm just going to end with some discussion time. Um, so if you could just turn to the people at your tables. We didn't get to watch the intro video. I'll kind of leave that um, to you to watch. That is posted on our website. Um, you can watch that intro video there. But now I'd like you to talk about these very big questions. So based off what we've been talking about, Teresa's understanding of the soul, the castle, that kind of thing, it's good for us to take a step back and to answer some of these questions. Because Teresa in the interior castle is going to push us. Teresa's not dainty. She likes to be tough. She's not going to go easy on you in the interior castle. If you don't know who you are, if you don't know who God is, if you don't know what your purpose is, and what your soul is, and what heaven is, if you don't know these things, you're going to get lost. Teresa wants you to know who you are. Because if you don't know who you are, you can't bring yourself to God. 
Who is God? If you don't know that, you're not going to be aimed in the right direction on your spiritual journey. What is your purpose? Why are you trying to get to God? Why are you doing this at all? And then what is your soul? Uh, actually, I would answer these three down. I would talk about these three down here. The other two. What is your soul? Like, How do you describe your soul to people? And what is heaven? What do you describe as meeting God? What does that look like? So I think for now, just take a few minutes to talk about these last three, whichever of these last three your table would like to talk about. I give you about five minutes to talk about those. So I hope you had some good discussion. Um, I'm not going to make you talk about what you talked about. I'm only going to look at one of these questions, who am I? Uh, I like this question. My answer to who am I is the first bullet here. I am who I am in the eyes of God, nothing more and nothing less, St. Francis. So, yeah. Um, who are you? Teresa wants you to get used to seeing the truth. What's true? is what God sees, not what temptations are asking you to see. Temptations want you to see yourself as more than what you actually are, and they want you to see yourself as less than what you actually are. The truth is what God sees. And for Teresa, what God is looking at when he looks at every single one of us is his potential spouse. For her, the entire journey, the spiritual journey, ends with a spiritual marriage, a union with God. So when God looks at us, he sees his beloved. And when we look at God, we see our lover. And our purpose is to love the lover. That's it. So who are we? We are what we are in God's eyes. Nothing more and nothing less. And what does God see when he looks at us? His beloved. And what are we when we look at God? The lover. And the purpose? To love the beloved. Which is all St. John of the Cross. He talks about that. The beloved in the lover transformed. Sounds better in Spanish, but that's the answer to who am I? God's beloved. You get asked on the street, a little kid asks you, now you know the answer, I'm God's beloved. And that totally changes life from chaos, chance, meaningless, to purpose-filled, with a goal, and with somebody walking with you along the way life becomes totally different and better, I would say. We are God's beloved. So to close, if you grab your hand out, again, I've said it a lot, but I do love words. So these words on the back of your hand out, this is Teresa of Avila's own handwriting. It's in Spanish. Uh, so this, uh, I believe, is a little bookmark that she wrote for herself and would keep in whatever she's reading, a little prayer that she wrote and kept with her um, uh, very frequently. So I wanted to include the original handwriting. It's always fun to see what somebody's handwriting is. The opening part here is the prayer in Spanish, then of course the prayer in English, and I'd like, all, uh, I'd like for all of us to recite the prayer in English together to close our time here. So let's begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Let nothing disturb you. Let nothing frighten you. All things pass. God does not change. Patience obtains all. Who has God lacks nothing. Only 
God suffices. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. So, um, I hope you enjoyed the first session. This session was very me-heavy. The other sessions will not be like that. I will be doing way less talking in the future. Um, the homework for this, at your, your own pace, is to read the first three mansions of Teresa. You can do that again online. You can do that uh, by a book. This is the Interior Castle again. This edition is by the Institute of Carmelite Studies. You don't need to get the study edition. And again, this is free, a different, slightly different translation, but free online, so you don't have to buy anything if you don't want to. Uh, and again, that's on our website. So your next, the next, the next session, we'll talk about the first three mansions that Teresa describes. What we'll do is we'll watch a short video by a priest who um, has been preaching on the interior castle his whole life. We'll watch a little video clip. And then your groups will discuss about that particular mansion. We'll come back together, talk a little, watch the next video. We will discuss about that mansion. And that's the entire format. There's no me telling you stuff. I'll just field questions and that kind of thing if I need to. So the next session will be next Thursday. You can come in the morning or the evening. The material is exactly the same. The style is a little bit different. The other presenter and I don't do things word for word the same. Um, but the chapters that are being covered are the same. It works. Yeah, this works out much better. That's why we wanted to do this. Yeah. Um, so again, you can come morning or evening. The first three chapters, the first three mansions of Teresa, are what's going to be covered next time. Uh, yes. If you want to purchase the actual book. Then, of course, Amazon. You can find many, many copies on Amazon. They'll ship it to you. You can also find it at most Catholic bookstores because it's so popular. Um, basically, any Catholic bookstore will carry it. Here, I don't know because my, my home is actually in Mansfield. So the closest uh, Catholic bookstore to us is Attleboro at the La Salette Shrine. I don't know of any others around here. I'd have to check that out. Um, the text is available online. I know you, know, if you can download go, it. Right? You can, yes. If that makes it easier. Yes. So the best translation is definitely this one. It's the most recent, so it uses language that we're more familiar with. It's by a Discalced Carmelite. Uh, who recently passed away. His name is Father Kieran Cavanaugh. This is how you spell it. And again, that book, um, there is a link to that book on Amazon on our website too. So. Do you know any good reason of that book in Spanish? Well, you can find the find Teresa's. Uh, is this the original spelling that old, awful Spanish? It is, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Spanish from Spain also is not good. There is. Uh, Father Kieran worked with a Spanish scholar to do this translation, so I would not be surprised if he had also done a Spanish translation. I can look up his name for you. That would be great. Yeah. I mean, actually, if you were going to read any of the original stuff in Spanish than reading John of the Cross's poems oh. in the original Spanish. Again, it's old Spanish, but because it's in the original, the poetry works much better. Right, yeah. I mean, the English <laughs> translations are nice, but yeah, if you know Spanish, then reading St. John of the Cross, his poems in the original, worth it. It's my name. Oh, it is? Okay, yeah. yeah. So I would definitely... Like, if I oh. spoke Spanish fluently, I'd be reading John of the Cross in Spanish. Thanks for the recommendation. Any other questions before we do break up? All right, great. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Hope to see you next Thank time. You.